in this sixth season of teaching relationships, we're looking at a theme made in heaven. We're going back to the basics. We want to look at the principles of relationship uh, from the Word of God. Uh, this will be applicable to both married and singles, wherever you are in your life right now. I want you to know that you are on God's mind and he has a plan for you. So if you are a single mother, God is watching out for you. He's watching out for you right now. He's watching out for you right now. You remember the woman that met the prophet Elijah in the Bible that said, you know, my husband is now dead and the creditors have come to take my son. God intervened for that woman. God is looking out for single mothers. Yeah. And he wants you to be able to move on also. And single fathers also. God wants you to be able to move on. So as we teach these relationship principles, I want you to open up your mind. If you're widowed, I, I also want you to know that God wants to meet you where you are, male or female. God has a plan for your life. Read the book of Ruth. You see how a young widow got an encounter with destiny, and God moved her life forward. A divine connection with a man of covenant, Boaz, and her life changed, and then she got into the lineage of, of, of Jesus Christ. That's God's plan. God has a plan for everybody. If you are divorced, God has a plan for your life. I was just having a quiet chat with the Holy Spirit in my heart a few days ago, and just asking, you know, sometimes you're just talking to God all alone, God, what, what, what's up with divorced people? What, what, what are you doing? And God said, have you forgotten? I believe it was just Jesus whispering to me, have you forgotten my encounter with the woman at the well? She did fall. She was on the fifth round. I still loved her. I still loved her. If you are the type that will write off divorced people, it's not Christ-like. God has a plan for everybody. He has something in mind. There's still destiny to be fulfilled. Jesus could have gone to many other people that day, but went to meet that woman at the well in John chapter 4. And he already knew. He said, you've been with four men. The one you are with right now is not even your husband. You're not even married, you know, to him. You're just fooling around with him. Yet I still love you. I, see, I can still create time for you. Jesus had an engaging conversation with this lady. And eventually turned this lady to an evangelist. Jesus has a plan for everybody. And his plans will unfold as we go into this series. That's why you shouldn't miss church. In fact, if you want to do well, don't come alone. Bring somebody that needs to hear what we're discussing this month. Relationship, I mean, principles don't change. Yeah, we just need to align ourselves with them. Wherever we are, what we need to get to the next level is alignment with the principles that make for progress. That's all. So that's what I'm saying this morning. Wherever you are, God has something for you in this series. If you're in a troubled marriage, Jesus is the one that calms the troubled waters. And he wants to speak into your marriage this season so that wisdom can come upon your heart. And you can do away with foolishness. Glory be to Jesus. God has a plan for your, your, your life, wherever you may be right now. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. Many years ago, before I got married, I think I was just dating my wife, you know, like the f first uh, few months of dating. But I'd, I'd made up my mind that that's the person I would marry. And we were already planning a bit. I think I'd met, I'd met our parents already. And, you know, I started, I'd already started saving up for the wedding rings and all those stuff. And then I was in my office then at this Christian Center this particular day, and a lady came in for counseling. And she was, you know, ushered into my office and sat in front of me. And at that time, she was, that week was her 10th wedding anniversary. She started telling me the story. How her husband left home from the day before the wedding anniversary and did not return until two days later. And all efforts to reach him, to even wish him happy wedding anniversary was futile. Yeah. The guy had, you know, in his mind had gone completely. This lady was crying and she was, she was I mean, as at that time, um, an executive in a bank, 
but she was, you know, she was shattered in her heart. She told me stories that broke my heart. I someone called to pick up words from the scriptures to encourage her. I wasn't married. I was telling myself this is bad business. <laughs> yeah. But I prayed with her and encouraged her. When she left my office for the next three days, I was second guessing whether I should marry or not. I was telling myself the money you are saving up will be better off on a landed property or something of sort than, you know, this. I, I, I started losing courage, you know. There's a way you can get to hear stories from around you and you will lose hope in the institution of marriage. So the big question this morning is, have you lost hope in the institution of marriage? Are there many, too many people around you who are telling you that it doesn't work? Who are telling you they are going to get burnt? What are you hearing? What are you al aligning your heart with? Are you shying away from marriage or pessimistic about the prospect of getting married? Maybe you have never been married, or maybe you've had one. Now, fear has riddled your heart because you, you, you just hear stories every day. One thing I want you to notice this, that someone's negative experience should not be the basis of your own expectation. Yeah. Someone's negative experience should not be the basis of your own expectation. The basis of your expectation should be God's word. What has God said concerning marriage? How did God say it should be? What's the mind of God concerning marriage? That should be the basis for your expectation. That should be the basis for your expectation. What has he said concerning marriage? So if you're ready to commit, you should commit with understanding. If you're already in a marriage, you should seek for better understanding. That's what we're teaching this series. That's what we're going back to the basics. It's about going into the world to bring out the mind of God concerning marriage. Glory be to Jesus. And as we go through this series also, if you need any kind of counseling, please do go to email us at familylive at elevationng.org. Let's get in the business together. Or call, call, call the, 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 the line, 0700 Elevate, and get an appointment to see a counselor, get an appointment to see a pastor. Yeah. Don't keep anything to yourself. Yeah. If you're listening to me right now here this morning and you feel that you're struggling with same-sex attraction, you're not alone. There are many people like yourself and many people have gotten deliverance from same-sex attraction. Don't get to that point where you start to believe that, you know, all the funny stuff going on in the world, and that's how you are born, and that's how, so, you know, and all that. Don't make the life of a person miserable by marrying somebody, especially a guy, just to have a child. But you're not attracted to the person. It's a terrible marriage that's going to come out of it. It's going to, your heart is going to be broken. The person's heart is going to be broken. Don't do it. Let's resolve the problem before you get married. Yeah. You can be okay. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah. yeah. You can be okay. God can help you out of it. You can gain deliverance from it. God can heal you from that inordinate affection. I've seen it happen. So I'm not telling you fables. We've seen encounters with God's power where all kinds of addictions are broken and all kinds of affections are, you know, and what used to attract you before, just boom. Sometimes it happens just like that. Sometimes it takes a process. But you need to align and first of all believe that God wants to help you. You don't want to live a miserable life of deceiving yourself. Glory be to Jesus. So today's big question to singles and couples, what is God's standard for marriage? What is God's standard for marriage? Before I get into it, I need you to understand that marriage is hard work. Hard work, but it's fulfilling work. It's fulfilling work. Hard work, but it's fulfilling work. And you need to search the mind of God to understand it 
so that you can be properly prepared for it if you're still single, and if you're married, so that you can make the best out of it. You can make the best out of it. Popular scripture, Matthew 6, and verse 33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things that be added to you. A translation says, learn all you can. Research and search for the place God rules. How he operates there. It said, when you found that out, operate it and everything will be added to you. Operate it and everything will be added to you. If you find out the mind of God concerning marriage and you operate it, it's goodness that you'll find out of it. That's what you're going to get out of it. One thing that you should know is that the principles that govern marriage is like the composition, the, 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 you know, the, the, the composition of water, for instance. Water is H2O. Two portions of hydrogen, one portion of oxygen. You get water. Am I saying the truth? Has that changed since the world started? Yeah. You only have flavored water and all other kinds of water that has something to it. If you have H2O in Nigeria, it's H2O. If you have H2O in America, it's H2O. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. The same thing. If we stick to God's original intention, marriage is ma it will be successful in Nigeria, in America, in Australia, in the Middle East, because God's principles govern marriage. Marriage is not the product of man's idea. It's not the product of man's mind. It was God that said it is not good that man should be alone. Adam never complained to God about, God, I want to marry. No. So marriage is not a product of anybody's culture. Have you seen any tribe, any culture where they don't marry? It's a universal thing. It came from the mind of God. Are you still with me today? Let's read from the book of the beginning, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now read from verse 15. I wanted to follow this story and then I'll unpack a bit and we'll round off. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That was Adam's job. To tend and to keep the garden. So man started with a purpose. God was very clear about the purpose. I created you. You're here to tend and to keep the garden. Man is a natural. Whenever you see a man that is pulling down, that is hitting a woman, it's, it's not, that's not the original nature. Something has gone wrong. Yeah. If a man ever pushes anything, it's to put her in place or put the thing in place. Yeah. And it's supposed to be a gentle thing because a natural does not use destructive force. It's to keep the garden and to tend it. That was the first assignment. Keep the garden and tend it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of the tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, um, you, you should not eat the day you eat you. Surely die and all that. And the Lord God said, look at that. Two things happened there. God gave man a mandate, a purpose, a work to do, and then gave him instructions as to how the, he should live his life. Don't eat this, don't do that. Then the next thing, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Young men, listen to me. Thank God this Saturday we're hanging out here and I'm going to be here for you. Say amen, all the singles. Amen. But please listen to me, young man. You need to find your purpose before you find a woman. Find your work. Let me, let me, let's take purpose out. Work, work. Yeah. <laughs> find work. To keep and to tend it. After that assignment, then the Lord said, ah, ah, in this work that I've given man to do, it's not good that I should do it alone. He will need help. Emotionally, psychologically, physically, he will need some help. Yeah. That's when the idea of a mate then came in. We're talking God's original intention. That's when the idea of a mate then came in. And the Bible says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the hair, and, uh, uh, and uh, threw them and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, all the birds of the hair, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that is suitable or comparable to him. 
And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. If you have any single person around you, tell them sleep. <laughs> look around you, look around you, just tell somebody sleep, sleep. Some people think that trying to get married is like business. You have to also. Don't also. <laughs> look at the process here. There's no, there was no hustling here. God laid him to rest. It is called entering into your rest in God. God is able to do what he said he would do. Yeah. When it comes to marriage, it's not about hustling. Ladies, stop the hustle. Yeah. Yeah. Some ladies actually think it's about all the hustling and jostling and, you know, yeah. It's about how many places you can be and how many guys that, you know, all that. Nah, nah. Sometimes it's just a waste of your time. Yeah. You just need to enter into God's rest. Allow him to do. When God finished, Adam slept. Then God moved. Yeah. The understanding in the Bible was that he took a rib, you know, and did all that. But he moved. Somebody say move. Uh -huh. God will move for you. I cannot get your amen. amen. But until you are resting, he can't move. When you enter rest mode, then he enters action mode. Yeah. Your action mode is placing him on rest mode. God will give you understanding. Amen. Yeah. You need to rest emotionally. You need to rest psychologically. You need to enter into your rest and focus on what he wants to do for you. Whether you're a young man or young lady listening to me this morning, you need to challenge yourself as you leave this service today to say my marital destiny is in the hand of God. Yeah. Marriage is not business. In business, maybe a bit of also. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And some bit of hard work. In marriage, just prepare yourself. And one of the ways to prepare yourself is to learn how to be at peace. Yeah. By just resting. Yeah. In fact, in this one, it was a deep sleep. You know the problem with many singles? It's a nap they've been taking. And God wants you to take a deep sleep. Yeah. A deep sleep. A deep sleep. Because he wants to do some stuff in your life. And he doesn't want anybody to take glory for it. Say amen, somebody. Yeah. Say deep sleep. Somebody say deep sleep. Yes. Look at your neighbor and uh, just say deep sleep. Yes. Because some married people too need to enter their arrest concerning their marriage. Yeah. All this one that you are chasing, you are chasing, you are chasing. Uh -huh. You want to read what is on the phone. You want to see what is in the iPad. They are fighting everything. Relax. Tell somebody say relax. Ladies, can you listen to me? Married ladies. You can't stop a man from cheating. Yeah. yeah. If you like, wake up in the middle of the night. You know, there's one video that, is, that was going viral. One lady that was trying to use the guy's finger to open his phone. He didn't know that the guy used a dog to lock it. A dog fingerprint. Their dog to lock the phone. Yeah. Enter into your rest. Yeah. Guys, be secured. Yeah, I know you are dating a beautiful lady. It doesn't mean you should follow her everywhere. Yeah. Because that's a problem sometimes. And because of our own insecurities, we push our spouses out of line. Because sometimes somebody can get frustrated because you are too nosy. And you refuse to enter into your rest concerning the marriage that God has given you. It's in that sleep mode that God moves. Go and read the book of Hebrews. God always telling his people, enter into your rest. He said he that entered into his rest has ceased from his own works. And then God starts to do his own works. Somebody sit with me this morning. Tap somebody and tell them, enter your rest. Say, I mean deep sleep, this please, this sleep. Yeah, don't take a nap, sleep well. <laughs> praise God. I said, praise God. So, when Adam woke up here, what happened was that the Lord has created a woman, verse 22, 
The rib with the Lord God are taken from a man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to, to man. And Adam saw, Adam said, This is now the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. We're going to be discussing that maybe next week. Boundaries. Cleave to his wife. And the two shall become, yeah. Two shall become one. Glory be to God. I said glory be to God. A few things as I round off. One, because marriage is not a product of man's mind, it's from the mind of God, you need to read the Bible if you want to be successful at marriage. Everything is sustained from a source. You want to sustain a fish, provide water because it came from water. Am I saying the truth? You want to sustain a human being, you give food because we came from the ground. Yeah. The food that came from the ground. That's why they're saying now, don't eat organ, uh, you know, organic food. The one that does not come from the ground, it, will, it can harm the body. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Everything that comes from the ground is what sustains us and sustains us well. This one that we're mixing all kinds of things with it. Let's go back to marriage 1.0. Yeah. First generation. According to the book of Genesis. Some people are now on 8.0. Some people like iOS 10.3. Yes. All kinds of marriages. All kinds of ideas. Do this and do that. In certain climes, prenuptial agreements. And even Christians are doing that. Yet, the Bible says that a man's life does not consist in abundance of the things that he possesses. By the time you are doing prenuptial agreement, that means your life is about what you own. And you want this person to have a part of it and not a part. Am I saying the truth? That's not marriage. That's not 1.0. Maybe that's 5.0. Because things have evolved. Man marrying man. Woman marrying woman. That one is 12 point something. Yeah. But male and female created it. Yeah. Not male and male. It's not Adam and Steve. It's Adam and Eve. Yeah. Somebody say with me this morning. Yeah. So read the Bible. It has God's original intention. And it has not changed. Not at all. It has not changed. It has not changed. It has not changed. Just like water. Water doesn't change. It's the same water. It's H2O. Yeah. It doesn't change, except it's something else. Secondly, seek God's presence and instruction. Seek God's presence and instruction. When God put the man in the garden, the Bible says at the, in the, at the cool of the day, God will come and fellowship with man and woman. Singles, listen to me this morning. If you cannot enjoy God's presence as singles, if you cannot cultivate his presence while you are still single, you're going to find it difficult in marriage. Because marriage will place more demands on you. If you are struggling to pray now, Please, master your prayer life before you marry. If not, you won't have any after marriage. You have zero prayer life after marriage. If you're struggling with reading the Bible now, if you're struggling with worshiping God on your own right now and having his divine presence come into your life, sort it out before you make somebody's life miserable. Yeah. Because to, 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 to understand kingdom marriage, you need to seek God's presence and God's instruction. Is somebody still with me today? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 4 and verse 12, he said, even if one is down, he said, the other one will pull him up. He said, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a three-foot cord is not quickly broken. And the third cord there is God. You need to keep bringing God into your life. To make sense of marriage, you have to understand that God has to be present in your life. Thirdly, be committed to God's purpose. I showed us, you know, in the scripture that we read, God had a purpose. See, people don't just meet. They meet according to God's divine ordination. Today, I hear people come to me and say stuff like, um, I'm better, better off being single than remaining married to this person. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. Did you ask yourself at the beginning, what does God have in mind for this? Yeah. Purpose, 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 purpose. If you don't think purpose, you will break a marriage anyhow. Yeah. Somebody can annoy you and you walk out. But if you know that the purpose is bigger than both of us, 
It's not about me. It's about God's purpose, first and foremost. And I want to align with God's purpose. So I'm going to stick it out and endure. If you are not thinking purpose, marriage, your marriage cannot last. You have to think that God has a purpose. He has a purpose. He has a purpose for this relationship. God has a purpose for this relationship. He has a purpose for this relationship. He has a purpose for this relationship. One big idea about marriage. I have like uh, four or five here, maybe next week or in another service we'll, we'll deal with this. I did, dealt with two in the last service. One is that marriage shows the relationship between Christ and the church, according to Ephesians 5 and verse 32. The way Christ loved the church is the way a man or a woman should love the spouse. So Jesus will not beat the church. Jesus will always forgive the church. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what we sang this morning. That's the idea. The Bible says that marriage is a mystery. It's, it's a Paul writing there in Ephesians 5 and, and 32. He said, I speak. He said, but this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church. When you understand that it's deeper than what we think. That just like Christ is the bride of the, or, I mean, church is the bride of Christ, when a man meets a woman, it's the typology of Christ and the church. It's beyond sex or flowers. These are just to color it, to flavor it. The real thing is that God wants to show us how Christ relates with the church. And that's why it gives us an opportunity to be able to marry so we can see it. That is tough. That Christ endures a lot <laughs> to be able to take you and I in. The most important one that I want to drop this morning as I drop this completely, which is very strong in my heart, and which I want every married and single person here to go with today, is that marriage is for holiness, not essentially happiness. The reason why many people are bailing out of marriages is that they claim that they are not happy in their marriage. God's original intention is not for you to be happy in the marriage. Happiness is a byproduct of a good marriage. What he wants is that you will become holy. I know that sounds scary. I'm going to explain. Yeah. Because somebody will leave this service and say, uh, Pastor of Elevation Church said, we're not supposed to be happy in our marriage. Yes. Yes. Invariably, that's what I'm saying, but with a slant. That you can be happy in a marriage, but when God thinks about your marriage, if you are happy and you are not holy, his own mission is not accomplished. Can I quickly read this scripture so that the looks on your faces can change. Ephesians 5, 25, 26, and 27. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for her, that he might do what? Sanctify her. Sanctify means to set her apart, or set him apart for purpose. That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <laughs> holy and without blemish. The process of removing blemish from anything will not always be happy. Process. Have you seen when there's some preparing wood before to remove blemish? to make it shine. That's what happens when we brush against each other. All this one that people are running, you want to run out of marriage because you're feeling some bit of, you know, discomfort and pain. It's part of the package. God's original intention is to sanctify her, wash her by the washing of the word that you may be without a wrinkle or blemish, or any such thing. That's a hard process. 
It includes you building patience. Yeah. One of our speakers at the Hangout on the mainland yesterday was saying something that, you know the truth? We, we, we think that when somebody slaps a man or slaps a woman in marriage, that it's the other person that provokes them. Every human being, when you are under pressure, it's what is inside that comes out. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Crush a car, what will come out? Fuel. An engine oil. If there's no human being inside you, you can't find blood because there's no blood inside it. Am I saying the truth? And that's when it's under pressure. When you press a human being, it's blood that will come out. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Press anything, it's what is inside it that will come out. When you come under pressure, if slap is not inside you, it won't come out. You will walk away. You just walk away. And that's when God will look down from heaven and say, this is more like me. Christ-likeness is holiness. Yeah. This is now more like me. They slapped Jesus. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They hung him on the cross. He died for the church. Husband loves your, love your wife as Christ loved the church that he died for the church. Hung on the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, to be successful in marriage, you need to die to self. Only dead people, people who are dead to self, to your idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Those are the people that can succeed in marriage. And that's that process of Christ likeness. They pierced him for the Kind of turn on his head, yet he was committed to dying for his bride, the church. If you don't understand all this, you can't make a success out of any marriage. I'm telling you the truth. This generation needs to understand what I'm talking about this morning and quit looking for only happiness in marriage. God wants you to change, He wants you to become a better person. Someone is going to annoy you, drive you crazy, like they did to Jesus. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Yet, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Only dead people, people who are dead to self, can make a success out of marriage. And that's when the goodness starts to come out, and then you'll be happy. Yeah. But you get into it looking for happiness, it's a long thing. It's a long thing. Lift your two hands to Jesus this morning and just receive wisdom in this atmosphere. We have taught his word this morning with revelation knowledge. So grace is here. Wisdom is here. The blessings of God are here. Peace is here. So if there's anyone here this morning, you came in without peace in your heart concerning your marriage, will you receive peace right now? Will you re re receive peace right now? Receive the wisdom of God right now. Somebody lift your hand and say, I receive grace. Grace to walk through the process. Grace to become Christ-like. Now that I know that this is God's intention for me. Grace not to quit. Grace not to run away.